that our Earth is ro rotating at just the right rotation, so it's not like an out of control a roller coaster. It's a miracle. The fact that the sun is just the right distance so it doesn't scorch our earth or turn it into an ice planet. The fact that the air we breathe is of the right density that we can function. And so many other countless things are proofs of God's reality. So that's not the message today. But what I'm going to tell you in your coats about is that there was a disturbing article in the news this past week. The article stated that at the start of 2014, a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor, Brian Bell, made an unusual New Year's Eve resolution. His resolution was to live for one year without God. I mean, we sang in Sunday school, we sung the song, sung the song um, Moment to Moment, I'm Kept by His Love, and we sang the song, uh, I Need Thee Every Hour. I can't picture going a day without God, let alone a year. Yeah. But that's what this guy set out to do. And the reason he made this resolution, he said, was his own loss of faith. He documented his journey without God in a blog post and had a film crew follow him around for a whole year. And at the end of the year, which took place last week, at the end of 2014, Bell made this statement. Here's what he said. He said, I've looked at the majority of the arguments that I've been able to find for the existence of God and on the question of God, existence or not, I have to say I don't find there to be a convincing case in my view. He said, I don't think that God exists. I think that makes the most sense of the evidence that I have in my experience, but I don't think that that's necessarily the most interesting aspect of my life, really. I find this former pastor's statements Disturbing for several reasons. Number one, if he wanted to quit on God, if he wanted to stop believing in God, he could have quietly slipped away into obscurity and never been heard from again. That's the way he should have pulled out of that. No, instead this guy has a camera crew following his every move for a whole year. He's got a blog post filed by countless people, and now he's doing tons of interviews. In his statement, he said, I don't think that's necessarily the most interesting thing about me. Really? Then why go to all the trouble of promoting that aspect of your life through the media? Why do that? Why raise red, red flags saying, oh, I'm, no, I'm an atheist now, I don't believe in God now. Why would you do that? And I can answer that question because those who are lost and in darkness, they just love this kind of stuff. Yeah. Every newspaper, every CNN type show had this guy on there talking about how he lost faith in God. The world's crowd loves this kind of stuff. Anytime a Christian, especially a pastor, renounces his faith and turns his back on God, there's someone with a camera and a microphone saying, tell us all about it. Give us all the juicy details. This guy is probably making a lot of money in telling his story will probably write a book from his blog post. And if a film crew was following him around for a whole year, a documentary movie can't be far behind. It's always a tragedy when someone quits on God. But it's even worse when someone literally sells their soul in the process to make a buck from their loss of faith. It grieves my soul. So that's the first thing that troubled me about this article, is that if he... We had a loss of faith, and we've had, all had moments where we were questioning God, doubting God. I kept it to myself. When Mary was going through all those things, it says she pondered these things in her heart. She didn't tell Joseph. She didn't tell nobody in the towns. She just wrestled with it in her heart. Many of us have had to do the same thing. If you're having doubts about your faith, the last thing you want to do is tell your kids, oh, listen, your dad's having some doubts about God. I'm just letting you know where my head's at right now. Or... Or tell your co-workers that you've been trying to win to Jesus. Ah, I'm finished with that Christianity yeah. stuff. I'm done with it. I'm out of here. Second thing, second reason why this article was disturbing was the fact that this guy seems completely oblivious to the damage he's doing by publicly renouncing God. In our Sunday school series on creation, we've been looking at the same disturbing trend 
lost scientists like Bill Nye, Stephen Hawking, the, the scientist that hosts the Cosmos Show, Neil deGrasse. It's bad enough that their spiritual blindness is sending them straight to hell. But there's just no telling how many lost souls are also being led astray from their lives that will end up in hell with them. No telling how many people. So many people believe the lie of evolution, which is just about a guarantee across the board that if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in the story of creation, then there's a good chance you're heading down a path of destruction even as we speak. I'm not saying you here, but I'm saying people that believe in evolution, usually, they usually don't have much faith in God. You can't really walk down the same road with those two things. Same thing with a pastor that loses his faith. It not only affects him, it also affects every member of his church. I mean, can you imagine if I came up here and just said something like, listen, I don't got a whole lot to say, but I'm just letting you know uh, I'm renouncing God and this will be my last message and uh, I'm going back to atheism. I mean, it would have a devastating effect on all of us. And it would do much damage within the church. I believe the church could recover. But when the people that you look to as the leaders in the church, if they fall like a ton of bricks, first thing you're going to think of, well, maybe he's right, maybe he's right. If, he, if he's not going to believe him, how can I? Then there's his own family to consider. If you tell your kids God isn't real, especially if you've been formally active in the church, your family was active in the church, You've just about written your kids a one-way ticket to hell. Because if you renounce God, they're probably going to do the same thing. The apple won't fall far from the tree. You say you love your kids, and yet when someone does something like that, and you know it doesn't even have to be that severe. This is about as severe as it gets where a father renounces God. But I know a whole lot of families where the dad, maybe the mom started to backslid, slide a little bit and then just said, yeah, we're not going to church today, kid. Just just go ahead and put the TV on. Put your pajamas on. Stay in bed. Next week comes. Nah, nah, nah I'm, I'm too tired. I'm just going to rest up this weekend. Six months, a year pass. That mom and that dad just stopped going to church. And kids stopped asking why a long time ago. They may not have renounced God, but they sure haven't done a whole lot of good for the spiritual condition of their own homes and their own children. What about his wife? Does she support her husband in this stand? Or, or does she quietly go on serving the Lord, praying that her husband gets right with God? It's very possible that maybe he even convinced her that God is not real also. I mean, men are supposed to be the spiritual heads of the home. But if they're not, it affects everyone else in the home. For a whole year, maybe even longer than that, this guy's wife kept hearing her pastor husband say, God's not real, God's not real, God's not real. God can't be real. I mean, it had to have taken its toll on her also. And that same premise was the basis for the movie God is Not Dead, which we're going to be showing. A philosophy professor begins his class by writing on the blackboard the words, God is dead. And he tells the students that anyone that wants to pass this class is going to have to renounce God or they're going to be failed. So it's happening. It's happening in public schools. It's happening in our colleges. Lastly, there's no telling how many lost folks were reading this article that I read or following his blog post or waiting for his book or movie to come out. Folks whose souls are literally hanging in the balance between heaven and hell. And this former pastor may have convinced them, well, you know what? What he just said is what I've always believed all along. He's right. I can't argue with that argument. God isn't real. And there it is. So on several levels, this article was disturbing. And with that introduction, let's look at the subject, is God real? The first thing I want to consider is, what caused this pastor to renounce God? Now, let me begin by stating I'm not a mind reader. I don't know what this guy was thinking, why he quit on God, or why anyone drops out of church and quits on God. I can't answer that question. Everybody's got their own reason. The truth of the matter is, this guy himself may not have fully known 
why he renounced God, why he thought God wasn't real. So who knows? But I would like to suggest some possibilities as to why he did renounce God. And these possibilities apply not only to him, but to anyone else that quits on God or that's thinking about quitting on God. Number one, the first possibility is maybe this former pastor wasn't saved. Perhaps he never truly received Christ as his personal Savior. There's a lot of people in pulpits. They're saying the right things, but there's an emptiness in their soul. The background information of the article said that he was a third generation Christian, meaning that both his parents and his grandparents were Christians and active in their local church. Now that can be a blessing and it can be a curse. It's a blessing to grow up in a Christian atmosphere, to be in church from the time you can walk and talk. I lost a lot of years, years that the locust has taken years. I'll never get back because I didn't get saved until an adult. Many of you can testify. We talked about Mrs. Smith. Been in the same church for 60 years. She was from the old school. You just don't see that kind of Christianity today. Faithfulness. So, if you had the opportunity to be in church since you were a young kid, man, you gotta, uh, you gotta, you're ahead of the game. The only good thing is that when I got saved, later in life, I knew I was saved. There was no doubt. There was no time of struggling. Well, am I? Am I saved? When I got saved out of a life of sin, out of a life of darkness, there was no doubt in my mind that something had happened. From the moment I asked Christ into my heart, my life was transformed. And I knew that God was real. The moment that the precious Holy Spirit came to dwell within me, I knew it. 2 Corinthians 5.17 declares, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that's exactly what happened. Whereas before I tried to read the Bible, thee thou knowest thus, couldn't make heads or tails of it. The day I got saved and opened up this book, it was like someone just turned the light on. It made sense. And I couldn't get enough of it. Back in the day, you couldn't pay me to go to church. I'd go Christmas, Easter, whenever I felt guilty about something. But after I got saved, I couldn't get enough of it. This is another reason why I found this article disturbing. If someone claims to be a Christian, then they've got God living inside them through the Holy Spirit. If you're born again, you've got God living within you. And it's impossible to have God living inside you and not know it. He's not a ghost that's going to appear like a mist and then vanish away. I mean, if someone was living in your basement, it wouldn't take about a day for you to realize, hey, someone's down in my basement. Someone's living up in my attic. And it's the same way. The body is the temple of the Lord. And I know there's someone living inside me that wasn't there before. And it's the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. The fact that he said he doesn't think God's real tells me he didn't know that God was living inside him or he wasn't. Earlier I mentioned that growing up in a Christian home is both a blessing and a curse. Having looked at the blessing part of the Christian home, the possible curse of it all is the fact that a lot of kids grow up in Christian homes. It's all they've ever known. They've been in Sunday school, youth group. They've been in kids club since the time they can walk and talk. Somewhere down the line, maybe they repeated some prayer that they were told to pray. Just say this prayer. Say this prayer. Oh, okay. Do I get some candy? Yeah, sure, you get some candy. Just say this prayer. Or maybe they went forward to make their parents happy. Maybe they'd done something bad that weekend and they figured, well, if I go forward, at least it'll get the heat off of me. Or maybe their brother or their sister went forward or one of their friends went forward and they just tagged along <laughs> and said the same thing. Who knows? Whatever the case, maybe as a young child they made a profession of faith, but they didn't get saved. Maybe they didn't fully understand it. Maybe they didn't repent. I mean, any possibility. I've talked to folks that said, yeah, I remember, I got it in my Bible the day that I said that prayer. I said that prayer there, and I got baptized a week later. Someone else would tell me, yeah, everybody came, and they would shake my hand and, and gave me the right hand to fellowship. I don't remember a whole lot about it, but there it is in my book. They said the words, but they didn't get bored together. 
So they grew up in the church. Knew their Bibles, knew all the stories, could, could tell you all the books of the Bible. They knew all the hymns. Could quote scripture with the best of them. Maybe even went to a Christian school, Christian college. And because of their upbringing, for the most part, they were living clean lives. I'm talking about good church kids. They grew up living the Christian life, maybe even married another Christian. And were active in the local church. But there was one problem. Spiritually, they were empty inside. It was all works. Making themselves work to be Christians. To, to, to maintain that, that facade. And they were trying to live the Christian life. But they weren't Christians themselves. In every church, there's at least one person that claims to be saved, but they're not. And they've got everyone fooled. They very possibly may even have themselves fooled. Because if you keep telling yourself, I'm, I'm okay, I'm all right. I'm not that bad. I think I'm saved. I hope I'm saved. Uh, uh, I'm sure I'm saved. After a while, you'll start believing it. And of course, the devil will be right there whispering in your ear, you're, you're okay, you're okay. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Don't say anything. What do people think if you come forward and say you, you're having doubts? What will your kids think? What will your pastor think? But the emptiness in their heart and the longing in their soul won't go, to, go away. And the older they get, the more empty they feel. And they're embarrassed to talk about it. So they just kind of go through the motions of the Christian life. That's possibly what happened to this guy. I'm sure he was a good guy. But the more he preached, the more empty he felt. Until he realized, I don't know God. And if you're having those kind of feelings, if you're here today and you're having doubts about your salvation... If you're wondering if God's real because you, you don't know Him, you can't feel His presence, you need to get that thing settled once and for all. Yes, Lord. Amen. Several people I've talked to have come to me over the years and said, Pastor, I think I am, I might be, but I don't want to go into eternity with a 50-50 chance of not knowing for sure. I want to get this thing settled. I want to do it again. You don't get re-saved. All it is is just doing it over. Maybe you did it as a kid, as a teenager, at some Billy Graham crusade or whatever, and there was so much going on, you just didn't get a full handle of it. Nothing wrong with getting that blessed assurance. I wouldn't want to leave this world not knowing for sure, so get her settled. A second reason why some lose faith in God. Because they've been deceived by strong delusion. Now, this is real important here. Here's the thing. The devil is going to use every means possible to lead folks astray, hoping that they'll turn away from God. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 declares, God is not the author of confusion. He's not. But I can tell you who is. The enemy is. He is the author of confusion, and he will use all kind of confusion to lead people astray. He'll get them situated in the wrong church. By wrong church, I mean a dead church, where they're not hearing the gospel preached, where the pastor's dead, the preaching's dead, and no one's getting nothing out of it. Or maybe it's a church where it's all entertainment. Great music, great songs, great uh, curricular activities. But they're not getting fed the word. He'll get them to read the wrong Bible. One that's so watered down they won't get much out of it. And then his greatest weapon is he'll use every media to slowly erode their faith in God. He'll put books in their hands that they shouldn't be reading. Books that deny Jesus. That he was the son of God or that he even died on Calvary's cross. That stuff's out there. I got no interest in it. You're not going to change my mind. And I'm not going to let any type of poison try to pollute my mind. He'll get them to watch programs that deny the existence of God or that promote the lie of evolution. That deny the fact that we're going to pull out of here in the rapture. Maybe they'll end up taking some philosophy class. Some humanism class, some psychology class, whatever it is. Any class that denies the existence of God or that laughs at any talk of God. Be careful what classes you take. Because if you hear enough of that garbage, it will begin to affect you like a poison. Notice what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians chapter 1. Very interesting. Here. Galatians chapter 1. You're going to see a pattern here in a moment. Galatians 1, beginning with verse 6. Here's what he tells them. 
He said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's a good verse to use against the Mormons who believe that Joseph Smith got the Book of Mormons from the angel Moroni who gave him some magic glasses. If an angel brings another gospel, which is what that angel Moroni supposedly did, let him be a curse. That's all you need to know about the Mormons right there. The Apostle Paul started the Church of Galatia a few years earlier. Now he's getting reports that they're promoting false doctrine, heresy, being led astray by false teachers. It only took place a couple of years after he started the church. And Paul flat out tells him, I marvel, I can't believe that you're so quickly led astray by those that pervert or corrupt the gospel. Then he makes this statement in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Turn over a page. He says, Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Paul insinuates that the Galatian believers had been literally bewitched. The term bewitched means to use magic or some power to cast a spell on someone so that they think or do or say something as if under a spell. Interesting side note that the hit show from the 60s, Bewitched, used that same title, same word. And as silly as that show was, it was one of the first shows to promote the idea that witches can be good and beautiful and just like you and me. What about that? Uh, turn over next chapter to, uh, sec to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This ties right in with it. 2 Corinthians to your left. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 3. Here's what he tells the Corinthians. Same situation. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled, that's the same term for bewitched, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So, what we're seeing here, is the fact that the early church was under attack just like we're under attack today. People are being led astray by false doctrine and, and heresy beliefs. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to give you one more. In Colossians chapter 2, here's one more that says the same thing. It's, it's worth looking at. Colossians 2, 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoils you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And then lastly, verse 18. Colossians 2.18. Let no man beguile you. It's interesting to note that Paul tells the Colossians also what they must do to be to not get beguiled, to not be led astray, to not end up like this pastor renouncing God. Colossians 2 5. Here's what he tells them they got to do. Be steadfast in your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. That's it. The best way to avoid being led astray by false doctrine is knowing your Bible. I don't know the habits of this pastor. But I got a feeling he wasn't into the Word. How you could read your Bible and not believe in God? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I don't believe it's possible. The more I read this book, the more my faith is increased. Because the God of the Old Testament is the God of today. He ain't changed not a bit. Being firmly grounded and rooted in the things of God will establish you in the faith. It'll anchor you down. That's what made those Berean Christians so strong in the Lord. You couldn't fool them. You couldn't deceive them. You couldn't put nothing over on them Berean Christians. They were in the Word. 
They knew their Bibles, Acts 17, 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. They hear a message preached. They receive it readily. Just wait. I can see them with their notepads just ready to write it all down. They received the message, then they went home and searched the Scriptures to make sure that pastor was telling it right. And if he wasn't, they'd let him know. Here's the problem today. So many Christians don't know their Bible because they're not reading their Bible. And they're being led astray. Someone comes along from some cult promoting something. Hey, that sounds pretty good. Count me in. Here's a disturbing passage that tells you right where we're at today. 1 Timothy chapter 4. You need to look at this. Because this is the day and age we're living in today. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Taking time at this point because this is what we're up against. We're trying to reach folks with the gospel, and the devil's working just as hard to lead folks astray. 1 Timothy 4 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, the last days, the time we're living in, the time right before Christ's return, some shall depart from the faith. You can include that pastor in that statement right there. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Is not that what happened to this pastor? He's promoting a lie and taking a whole lot of folks with him. Whatever he had going for him, it's like his mind has been seared with a hot conscience that he can't recognize that God is real. Friends, we are living the latter times, the last days, and this is why so many are departing from the faith. Because they're giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Some renounce God. Others find themselves in some cult like the Jehovah Witnesses or the Mormons. Or perhaps some terrorist religion like Islam. And I've got news for you. As the time of the Lord's return draws near, it's going to get a whole lot worse. Turn to your left. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's going to get a whole lot worse. Bad as it is right now, it's going to get worse. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is probably the greatest chapter that speaks about the coming Antichrist. Beginning with verse 3. This is talking about the coming Antichrist. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. There it is again. That's two passages that talk about people falling away from the faith. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, the Antichrist who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with, yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. That's talking about the Holy Spirit. This world would be a whole lot wicked if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit holding back the forces of evil. But there's coming a day after the rapture of the church when we pull out of here that the Holy Spirit's going to step back and stop holding back the evil. And when the tribulation takes place, there's going to be evil unleashed upon this world that has never been seen before, the likes of it. Now, verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be Satan. When I read that passage, I think about this past. I want to just grab and say, listen, listen, this is what it's talking about. This is what's happening to you. You're believing a lie to think that God's not real. Now, verse 11, this is the key. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This passage of Scripture is talking about the coming of Antichrist, who I believe is alive today, waiting for the stage to be set. That's how close to the end we are. The Antichrist won't come to power until after the rapture takes place and the tribulation begins. 
But notice it mentions a strong delusion that will cause people to believe the devil's lie. Folks, I believe that strong delusion is already started. It's already at work. How else to explain the fact that so many are pursuing witchcraft and the occult and atheism and UFOs and aliens and zombies and whatever else is out there that they're pursuing? How else to explain it? The only thing that's keeping it from being much worse is the Holy Spirit. Multitudes of people, when the tribulation comes, will worship the beast, the Antichrist, and take the mark of the beast. And once they do, they've doomed their souls for all eternity. If a pastor can be so deceived to renounce God, it's possible that anyone can potentially be led astray. Let me stop here a moment and give you a warning. You need to use discernment concerning what you watch, what you read, what you listen to, who you're talking to, because taking in too much of the wrong doctrine, too much false teaching, listening to bad counsel, watching blasphemous movies that twist the stories of the Bible. You don't know how excited I was to go see this movie about Moses and Exodus. Until I started hearing, they changed everything. And I already let, it already left a bad taste in my mouth, the Noah movie. The way they screwed that movie up, I said, you know what, I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to pay that kind of money to come away mad and disappointed. So I'm not going to go see it. And I'm not fussed with anybody that is. But I'm just saying, why can't they just stick to the story? I don't need to watch something where they say that the, when God brought the plagues and turned the waters of Egypt into blood, that it was because of crocodiles that were having a feeding fest. I mean, good night. Or the fact that the reason they were able to walk across the parting of the Red Sea was because a tsunami was coming and it pulled back all the water and then came back on top of them. No, that was the hand of God. There's radio pastors, radio broadcasts that are promoting false doctrine. And if you don't know your Bibles, you're not going to know it. And you're going to take it hook, line, and sink it. TV evangelists. Some of them are good, but some of them are shysters. And if you listen to the wrong ones and you're not grounded in the Word of God, you're going to go lickety-split down the rabbit trail in a wrong direction. Spiritually, it can and will mess you up. Harold Kent, he's gone now, but I know so many people that were <coughs> listening to the stuff he was promoting that the church age is over, uh, that, that you can't be born again. I mean, all kind of nonsense. I used to listen to him just to get myself fired up, just to get mad. And there's no telling how much damage that knucklehead did to the cause of Christ because I got friends that got hooked into it. I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. I don't need to read the Quran to know how to, how to address Muslims. I don't need to read the Book of Mormon or the Watchtower material to have ammunition to use against Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons. I don't need to do that. I don't have to know what nonsense is being promoted on TV. All I need to know is this book right here. That's it. Amen. Amen. If I know this book, that's all I need to know. Yes. And that's all you need to know. That's right. I need to know what I believe and why I believe it. I had a friend that would read everything. And he used to say, I just want to know what, they, what, they're, what they're into so I can, I can argue with them. I said, man, be careful. You don't know if that stuff's got, got something in it that might mess it. Sure enough. He read all the material, everything. Any, anything anybody was promoting, he read it all. Got himself so confused, he didn't know what he believed. Messed him up real bad. He kind of renounced God also. So it showed me, you know what? We're called to study, to show ourselves the proof of the God. The workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word truth. That's it. There's a third reason why some lose faith in God. They never develop a personal relationship with God. Now listen, if that's the case that you feel today, you've never really gotten to know God, we're starting a series tonight on how to know God, how to hear the voice of God. Listen, if you don't spend time with God and get to know God, You'll never come to know if God's real. That's what separated David from Israel's first king, King Saul. King Saul, we are told, was a goodly man, but he wasn't a godly man. And there's a big difference between the two. David had his fault, but he was always a man after God's own heart, which also separated him from his successor, his son Solomon, who became Israel's next king. Solomon started out loving God and living for God, but he allowed other things to replace God's love. 
Uh, this is what we're told in 1 Kings chapter 11 about Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 11. I mean, think about it. He was the wisest man that ever lived. If anyone should have had a close walk with God, it should have been him. But here in 1 Kings 11, verse 1, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after other gods. Solomon claimed unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. That's a tragedy. One of the greatest men of the Bible who wrote some of the greatest books of the Bible. His heart got turned away from God. He may not have renounced God, but it's just about as close as you can get it. Turning your back on God is just like renouncing Him. It's forsaking Him. When I read a passage of Scripture like that, I wonder, how could that possibly happen? He wrote the book of wisdom, Proverbs. And the answer is, it can happen to any one of us if we allow things to replace God in our affections. In the parable of the sower that sowed seed, some of that seed fell on thorny ground. Some of it fell on stony ground. But the result was the same. They turned them away from God and they became unfruitful. Listen to this. I'm just about done. Mark chapter 4, verse 16. These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, they immediately receive it with gladness. Like so many people, when they first heard the gospel, they're excited about it. But they got no roots. They have no roots in themselves. So they endure for a time afterwards when afflictions or persecutions arise for the word's sake, immediately are offended. And they're gone. They heard the word gladly, but they got no root. They didn't get grounded and rooted in the things of God, and they got blown away. Blown right out of the water. Then we are told this. And these which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of, mark this down, other things, entering in, chokes the word, and it becomes unfruitful. I love the holidays, but I'll tell you, I'm glad that Christmas is over, aside from going broke. Just the whole frenzy of buying, buying, did I get the right thing, did I get the wrong thing, did I get the right presents for myself, whatever it may be. It's like a feeding frenzy. It's not what Christmas is about. And people are going to be consumed with their gadgets till the cows come home. It's replaced God in our affections. All the things, all the gadgets, all the, all the stuff that's out there has replaced God in our affections. And I say, God help us. Here's the thing. If we as Christians don't develop a relationship with God, which can only happen by spending time with Him, and listening as God speaks to our hearts and knowing God's word. If we don't do those things, God's going to remain a stranger to us. Someone we're not comfortable talking to or being around. Someone we'll start to wonder, well, is he really here? Am I talking to myself? That's the problem. You spend some quality time alone with God. You'll come out of there glowing like a hundred watt light bulb. You'll come out of there jumping for joy saying, my God is real. Praise God, my God is real. I know He's real. One last reason why some lose faith in God. Because they allow the tri life's trials to overcome their faith in God. They allow life's trials to overcome their faith in God. Life's hard. You've probably already figured that out. Life is hard. And our journey through life will have its share of heartbreak. It will have its share of disappointment. We will have our share of loss. Times that just don't make any kind of sense. Situations where we cry out to God, Why, God, why? Those kind of situations can shake the foundations of your faith. And it can knock you to the point, knock you there to the point where you're wondering, is it worth getting back up? Job lost everything in a moment's time. His kids, his possessions, his health. 
and at a time when he desperately needed to hear words of encouragement from his wife. Instead, she said, why don't you just curse God and die? Call it quits. And that's exactly what some Christians do. They may not curse God, but spiritually they begin to die. The moment that pastor renounced God, he began to wither spiritually. Here's the thing. The enemy can't take away our salvation because it's eternal and everlasting, and that means forever. We didn't do nothing to get saved. We can't do nothing to lose our salvation. But what the enemy can do is rob you of your joy. You go too long without the joy of the Lord, you're going to start questioning if God is real. He can fill your heart with doubt, fear, and unbelief. Poison your soul with those things. You allow the devil to plant a seed of doubt in your mind, it'll fester. And before long, you'll start questioning everything. Bitterness, disappointment, and loss can poison your soul. And if we don't give our burdens to God, all those things I just mentioned, if left unchecked, can turn your heart away from God. Listen, whatever heartbreak or tragedy you're dealing with, whatever bitterness or disappointment you're struggling with, you've got to wait on God for the healing process to begin. God will never leave you or forsake you. And we must do the same thing with Him. Amen. He's been too good to us for us to turn our backs on Him now. I like what the Bible says in Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Right now you're facing a long night of weeping, of sadness. Maybe you're going through the valley of despair. Maybe you've recently passed through that valley of the shadow of death. No matter what trial you're going through, don't quit on God. Because joy cometh in the morning. God will restore your joy. He has promised that He will. Amen. Several reasons why folks quit on God. Why some begin to question if God is real. In a moment's time, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And the Bible says it's better not to partake of the Lord's Supper than to partake unworthily. So maybe you need to do business with God. Maybe you need to get some things right with God. What a wonderful time to start the new year off with just, just rededicating your yourself to God. Cleaning up whatever dark areas of your life that have been holding you back from serving God. As I said earlier, if you've got doubts about your salvation, boy, it'd be a wonderful way to start the year off getting that assurance that you know, that you know, that you know that you're saved. Or maybe if you've just been going through the motions of the Christian life, just kind of, just kind of running on vapors to be able to come here and put a stake in the ground and say, you know what? I'm starting this year right. I'm getting things right with God and going for all the custom. Why don't we all stand?